Channel 17, The Collectors. Funding for The Collectors is made possible by Fireman's Fund Foundation. We are proud to support this fascinating look at the world of rare and exotic treasures and the men and women who spend their lives collecting them. Meet some collectors from Maryland's eastern shore. And they are as nice a bunch of people as you'll find anywhere short of Camelot. The samplers 15 years ago were very nice pieces of 30, 40, 50 dollars. How about 350 to 400 now? Oh, Marylanders come to the Eastern Shore to slow down, relax, lay back, eat a little crab. It's a tough life. to the collectors. Appraisals today are at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. And Dana, I swear, this is the first time ever that half of our audience has come by boat. And we have so many interesting things to look at today. Our first collection was originally gathered by a sea captain on his adventures around the world. In the days of tall ships, Captain Leonard Taws had this house in Crisfield, but his real home was the sea. Granddaughter Elizabeth often reads his journals about voyages from Maine to Galveston and around South America. At 10, he took to the sea as a cabin boy on the brig Water Witch. Later, he became captain and part owner of the schooner city of Baltimore. In the same year, 1884, he had her portrait painted by a very famous marine artist, William Pierce Stubbs. The men in town always liked to hear him talk about his voyages, and he would sit in the hardware store for hours around the pot-bellied stove and talk with them on cold days when it was too bad for them to go out on their boats. Elizabeth is fond of mementos from various ports of call, like this sailor's valentine sent to her grandmother. And they were sentimental, all made by the natives, mostly in Barbados. And of course, their scrimshaw. It shows what the sailors were thinking about when they were away from home. Because these voyages sometimes lasted over a year. An entire Eskimo hunting party is shown on this cribbage board made of walrus tusk. It belonged to a captain in the seal trade. I found that Elizabeth has her own sailing fleet. Models, a ship in wool work, and walls full of hand-carved ships in boxes made by sailors during long hours at sea. Here we see the British ship, the Kate of Plymouth. All of her sails and the lines are in order, and she just sails on in her diorama box. The collection started with this find at a local farm auction. I still don't know why in a local Eastern Shore farm auction, a foreign boat would have found a port. 
There are tin sails on this American full ship, evidently made by a less gifted carver. The largest box holds the ship Mary, complete with crew. It's a full story of a ship coming home. One sailor depicted this ice storm. At the time, he probably would have settled for a brig sailing calm seas with what Elizabeth calls a flirty look. Captain Ta's brother sailed the China Sea where he found this fan. The figures wear silk clothes and have faces of ivory. And speaking of ivory, here's a head carved of one solid piece. It's believed to be from 19th century Shanghai and of Kuan Yin. It's in wonderful condition. Very few age lines or cracks. Uh, well, on the table where she sits, I keep a tumbler of water. Isn't this a good tip for our collectors, too? If they have cabinets, for example, of ivory carvings that require some moisture content, how about just little glasses of water in yes, the cabinets? Yes, it does help. Does it help? It does, indeed. The ivory carvings in Elizabeth's collection and her other pieces from around the world are cared for like old friends. No doubt Captain Taws would appreciate their safe harbor. Oh, I like it. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Charles Hall. Hi, Charles. Uh, it's beautiful. What is it, a sewing cabinet or a... It's a sewing cabinet that belonged to my great-great-great-great-grandmother. It's uh, from Somerset County, Maryland. And the interesting thing I find about it is the center drawer, which you could put spools in and run a dowel through to hold the spools. Oh, I see. Spools fit in here. Dowel goes all the way through. Right. And at one time, this little section here was the secret compartment that had a sliding top. Oh, it did. Of course, that's disappeared over the years. What is this made of, do you think? Pine, I believe. Very attractive piece now. Have you dated it? From family history, I think somewhere in the 1830s, but I'm not really sure. Well, it, it, from the construction, it appears to be that way. Um, frankly, I've only seen one other one like it. It's quite exceptional. If we try and put a value on this, we've dated it already, but if we try and put a value on it, it's almost subjective. Um, I, it would not surprise me in the slightest to see a very excellent piece of this nature in the five to $600 range. Um, I base it on a comparative thing of what spool cabinets are like. And spool cabinets themselves, the little small ones, are three and $400. This is even more choice. Thank you. Nice one, thank you. Hello. Hi. How are you? Fine. What's your name, sir? George Fenton. Hi, George. Well, it's obviously a Singer sewing machine, but there must be something special about it. Do you know? It's called a featherweight uh, because of the lightweight and the scale down dimensions. Uh, oh, it, and the old ones were so heavy. Very heavy. I, if you take the old ones even out of the old cabinets and you go to lift them out, they just weigh a ton. So this is the first featherweight style of yes. Singer. So we're in what dates now? Uh, late 40s, early 50s, I believe. A little bit tough to put a value on this. You see, if um, if we talk about the old uh, treadle machines, the old treadle machines can be in good cabinets. The old cabinets could be anywhere from $150 to $400 if they're intricate. Then you go into the great name of Singer and some of the cabinets a little more modern, into Art Deco, and you have two and $300 pieces. Tough for me to give you a figure, but I'm off the top of my head, I'm going to say, because of its uniqueness, about $150 to $200. OK. okay. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Hello. What is your name? Judy Lawrence. Judy, a wonderful coverlet. Let's hold it out just a little bit here. It's, okay. It has a name on it. Mary Westervelt. has M. Westervelt. Mary Westervelt. That's family? Yes, uh -huh. it's my great-great-grandmother. And it was made in 1839. Oh, doesn't that make it the nice for the appraiser? Here. But look, <laughs> look here. On July 4th is when it was finished in 1839. How appropriate. These, this was done on an, a, a jacquard loom, I feel, uh, with the reverse pattern. And on the reverse, it will show white with the pattern in blue, as opposed to blue with the pattern in white. Pieces of this nature, obviously, we can date them very well. They mean so much to us subjectively in the family. But here's a piece as just as well done as you will ever see. I would say this piece would have a value even of an historic nature of somewhere around $650. Mm, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. thank you. Hello there. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. 
How are you? Fine. What's your name, sir? Horace Wilson. Mr. Wilson, may I hold that? Mm hmm. Tell me about it. Well, it's a uh, clock uh, and a night lamp clock. The dome revolves against the fixed hand. There's a kerosene lamp inside. Winds from the bottom. It has a, uh, a patent date of 1868. 1866. It does. 1886, I beg your pardon. 1886. It's been in my family since oops, all those years, does I guess. Does the spring still work? It's working now. It is working yeah. now. Yeah. Well, the time is almost right, too. Um, how do you judge something like this in terms of value? Because you don't see these in the antique books. I have no idea of value. I was hoping you might give me some sort of a clue. Well, let me give you a clue, and then we'll see how close I am. I feel it is totally distinctive. Th this is in milk glass. It is uh, in just excellent condition because of the intricacy of it and the fact that it is so unique. I'd put a value on it of just about $300, and I don't think I'm very far off. Okay. Okay? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. How are you? Pretty good. How are you today? Fine. What's your name? Matt Haley. Matt? You know what it is, I bet, don't you? Uh, it's a gas shade. That's right. It's a gas shade. You see, the electric shades had a very small fitter rim, maybe two and a quarter, two and a half inches, if you look at some of yours, sometimes up to three inches. But this is a gas shade. It did not hang like this. It sat like this. And it had more of a flare on it so that the gas would not, or the flame would not come out and uh, through the wind or something else and break this very fine opaline. And they call this cranberry opaline. Fenton Glass Company has made these of a newer nature. But the nice thing is they stamp them so we know that they are reproductions. This is an old one. Is this in the family or do you know? Um, no, not from mine, but I know it came from an Eastern Shore family here of a woman who died only a few years ago. Um, and she was in her 80s when she died. That's wonderful that we, you have this and you have the documentation on it. These parts, this hobnail, is called your opaline, the cranberry, dating it to before electricity, so we could be anywhere from 1860 up to 1880 or 1890. The shade alone, just about 150 to $200. All right. It's a wonderful one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lighting devices themselves are so very popular and just recently, Dana had the opportunity of meeting Barbara Lindenkall and seeing her very excellent collection. I think you'll like it. The wood gleams, the candles glow, the lamps flicker. There's a special ambiance here that is created by Barbara Lindenkall's collection. Practically everything around here is used in the home because um, that's the beauty of it. Even the doll in the corner of the family room has her own tiny tapers. An old lantern with matches for striking sits on a sideboard in the kitchen, while a gimbaled brass lamp is beached permanently on the wall nearby. This unusual kerosene lamp, called an onion lamp, could have been carried by its bale handle from attic to cellar to light the way. Barbara lights up when she talks about her collection. Lighting is interesting, exceedingly because you can go back so many years and say 7,000 years, it was almost all the same. And then all at once in the last 250 years, it started. The innovations of modern mankind. The first lamp as we know them were very simple. They were called Phoebe lamps or cruises, but the most common name is Betty. Betty lamp came because it was, as it was improved upon, it became known as a better lamp and they shortened it to Betty. Barbara's collection includes beautiful cut crystal whale oil lamps, camphene lamps with a long spout to keep the wick far from the flammable liquid, and the colorful array of kerosene lamps. The peg lamp came along in the latter part of the 17th century. Now this is unique, and it shows the cleverness of the people who manufactured these things and, and really invented them. And all they did was they carted this around from place to place in the house, and then they sat it into the candlestick itself. If someone should represent something made in brass as being early American, before, say, the 1700s, is it authentic? Uh, some people will 
I have to say it, misrepresent, okay? And they'll say American sticks. Not so. If they go back to a certain period of time, they are either English or on the continent. And that's it. It's really pretty amazing how far lighting has come in a short time. It isn't glamorous. It's not like some other uh, parts of the antiquity, but it is a very interesting thing, I think. Hey, Leaky Lukey. The Eastern Shore is famous for its beautiful colonial homes. Next, we'll take you inside two of them, beginning with Ted Dorman at Liberty Hall. Liberty Hall Plantation and its rather substantial chunk of land belonged to one family for 300 years. But they ran out of gentlemen, and uh, there were some elderly ladies that inherited it, and when they died, it uh, passed on to other hands. Ted Dorman and his wife bought it as a summer retreat from Washington, D.C. in 1961. Now he's here year-round. The heart of Liberty Hall is a generous room painted pink in keeping with the spirit of early days. And it was probably a large room because these early settlers were great dancers. They danced a great deal, and they also held court. According to records in 1798, there were 11 slaves on the plantation. We now have one slave, and that's me. The home is full of fascinating things, a pistol collection, a chess table from Ted's family home in New York, a large Colonel Beam sculpture, and this miniature chest from the Netherlands. The china belonged to Queen Marie of Romania, who was a very important gal in her time, and I believe the mother of King Carl, but she ran the show. Ted loves clocks. His father, also a clock collector, once had dinner at the Rockefellers and heard 100 of them strike at the same time. He was impressed. But they are a challenge, and it upsets me when they don't run, and I feel happy when they do run. And most of the time, they behave pretty well, but you have to talk to them. You see, they've got tremendous age, and the machinery naturally gets worn down a little bit, so it doesn't do to expect too much of them. But with regular oiling and care, they serve you well. Ted shows his clocks and Liberty Hall to the public on yearly home tours, but his peacocks are the main attraction. People look at the peacocks more than they do the house. A river view can be seen from our next colonial home, Bounds Lot. The earliest part of the house is from 1685. A few years ago, an 18th century home was joined to it. Bob Withy and son Rob enjoy the history of Bounds Lot, which they say was the residence of Samuel Chase, the firebrand of the revolution. During renovation, a huge cooking fireplace was revealed, which shows that this great room was once a kitchen. In this room, there's much to admire. A chest on frame with oyster marquetry, an Irish rosewood table, and this low boy of Connecticut Valley cherry with original brasses. In the Withy's collection, Bob says there's one painting that's a puzzle. They say the Lord North reviewed his troops and his wife dressing gown. So is it Lady North or Lord North? Huge fireplaces have their problems. If we had anybody unwanted that visited in the wintertime on a windy night, I think we could open the door and push them in the room and they'd go right up the chimney. There's such an updraft in the room. When the Withies show you around the house, they won't let you take anything too seriously as you enjoy the charm of the rooms. My father likes to say that people on the eastern shore embroider tales, and that ain't cruel. And they have something else in common. They're proud of keeping the past alive. To the Withies, Bounds Lot is warmth, comfort, and a whole lot of history. Here's the scoop on ice cream scoops. The challenge, yet your favorite flavor, from the container into the consumer. Simple? Well, from 1878 to 1940, 241 inventors applied for patents for ice cream scoops, or dippers as they were sometimes called. At least half of them were eventually manufactured, and collectors are dipping deep in their pockets to scoop them up. George Cluel was first with the conical design with a key-operated scraper. 
it was refined and copied by many other inventors. Raymond Gilchrist perfected the squeeze-handled ice cream dipper. His manufacturing and marketing techniques made his designs as popular with early confectioners as they are today with collectors. The most beautiful design was John Manos' heart-shaped dipper. He was told it would never sell. It was too well made. Of course, they're the ones everyone loves. I wonder if they ever thought of this. Back to you, Bob. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine, thank you, and you? Fine. What is your name? Phyllis LaRoque. Phyllis, this is one of the nicest pieces of silver that I have seen. Anything special about it, family-wise? Yes, it was made by Samuel Kirk for my mother's wedding gift. Made mm. personally? Made personally for her, for her wedding gift. And Kirk, one of the great names he of Silversmith Companies? and my grandfather companies. were very close friends. Oh, how mm -hmm. nice. Imagine the subjective value to us of something like this that was made by Samuel Kirk. Now, I feel inadequate as an appraiser when it comes time to appraise something like this because I could look at it and say with the magnificence of the silver and the repose, it would have a value of perhaps five to six hundred dollars made by Samuel Kirk for the family. My goodness, three times that. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Well, Kirk wouldn't repraise it for me. Oh, I don't blame him. <laughs> it's, it's just great. Thank, Thank you so much for bringing it. Thank you. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine. And your name? Sue Conklin. Sue, my a tough time in our lives, wasn't it? Yes, my father sa saved this, and he wrote on here, please save. Never destroy this. Well, you can understand why. See? It's, um, and the date, November 1963, Life magazine. There are four or five Life magazines that have a value so far as, other than just a subjective interest that we might have. One would be the very first one, which is worth about $150. The number two issue, worth about $50 to $60. And then some of the great tragedies of our country, such as this. I often see these framed. The value is not real high, but we're still in the $15 to $20 range. And what a collectible. Just a collectible. Even though it was a sad time. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. What's your name? Jean Lusby. Well, I can see what it is because it's got the apple on it. And isn't that a great, it's a peeler, not a corer, isn't it? Yes. Here's what's interesting to me. It's extremely old. It's so much older than the kinds that we normally see that were in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Have you had anyone give you a hint or do you know from family how old it is? No. Can no. I give you a thought? Yes. I'm clear back into the 1840s, 1850s. And honestly, maybe a little bit before that. Everything is hand forged on it. This blade is hand forged. I think this is so interesting in that this is what you used. You held it right up against the apple. You turned the handle and you peeled your apple. Not a bad idea with some of the things that are on the skins of apples now. I'd like to have mine peeled. <laughs> um, it is choice. If you look in the book, you'll see these anywhere from $100 to $150. I want to go much higher on that if I may. I'm going to say you're in the neighborhood of $225 to $275 because of its primitive nature. It's delightful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. What is your name? Nancy Jo Fenton. Nancy Jo Fenton. Let me hold this here for a minute. What is it, Nancy Jo? Well, at first I thought it was a pie cutter, but it's a pinking shear. It is, isn't it? Something I just noticed, patent dates of all different countries. Right. All the way from the United States through many of the European countries to Russia in 1903. Really? And these early dates are 1899? 1897. 1897. I didn't realize. I thought once you establish something as a patent in the United States that you didn't have to patent every country, but you do. And it's workable. It clamps on to the table. And then the handle works. And it still cuts material. And it still cuts material. If we looked in the book, first of all, it's easy to date, but if we looked in the book, we would find that the value of this would be somewhere in the $100 range, anywhere from a little bit below to considerably above. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to see it. Hello. Hello. What is your name? Sylvia Cohn. 
Sylvia, it's absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to let you hold it on your lap and turn it just a little bit toward the camera. Would you do that? Now, one of the reasons I'm not handling this, uh, several reasons. All of these flowers are porcelain. And if you have things of this nature, not just like it, but if you have things of this nature, you will see that all of the little pieces are beautifully crafted. Every porcelain is crafted. Every flower. If we come back up here, you see this? little grapes on the head wreath, all the way down to a porcelain face. And the porcelain face is not cracked. It's in remarkable condition. These are little um, cherubs or angels or putis, as they call them, if they have wings. How about a mark? Is there a mark anywhere on your piece? One here from the top. It's on the bottom. OK. Here. Uh-oh. Now, I'm going to let you turn it because I want the camera to catch this. There's a reason. Can you turn it to show that mark? We have to, we have to see this for a reason. Right here is a long cross swords mark. The mark is early Meissen. We well could be in the late 1700s, the early 1800s on the piece, made perhaps in the Dresden area, but in Meissen, so extremely choice. My dear, your piece is $5,000. Oh. oh, goodness. Yes, goodness. I was going to guess of that 800. <laughs> <laughs> that is just incredible. Isn't it? We've had such a wonderful time here in Maryland the last couple of weeks, and it's been a real pleasure to see all of these things from our American history, from samplers to John F. Kennedy. And haven't the people been wonderful? Terrific. And you brought in such great things. We appreciate it. I'm sure everybody loves it. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time on The Collectors. Stay with us for the Victory Garden, next here on Channel 17.